Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a show dedicated to providing up-to-date information and news to Hawaii home buyers, sellers, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in various leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a lawyer and also was the former head of a Hawaii title and escrow company. And now we work together as a team to bring you the latest in Hawaii real estate. All right. And, you know, in terms of uh, the interest rates, you know, today is actually below 7%, uh, conforming rates 6.75%. So it's a really positive news for both buyers and sellers looking at Hawaii real estate. And today we have a very special guest, Richard Emery, a colleague of ours on ThinkTech Hawaii. He's also a real estate commissioner, Hawaii real estate commissioner, principal broker of Hawaii First Realty, vice president of Hawaii Affairs for Associa Hawaii out of their corporate office. And did you know he's also an expert witness and instructor for continuing education classes for realtors? Wow. So today is all about the future of condo ownership. So uh, we're going to talk about the future of maintenance fees, reserve studies, and affordable housing in condos. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, Richard. Aloha, both of you. Nice to see you both again. Thank uh, you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being with us. And Richard, you do such a fantastic job with educating realtors and the real estate community. And so based on your current courses, I just was wondering, what are the key trends that we should know about in Hawaii real estate? And what about the legislation leg legislation, and everything like that? Can you kind of give us some um, ideas of what you're seeing or what, what you're teaching? Well, with, the, with regard to the legislation, uh, we see our legislators always interested in more consumer protection. So you see new laws passed every year that fine tune or add consumer protection requirements for uh, buyers of real estate and or condominium association boards or whatever they may be. So uh, you're seeing a lot more consumer protection driven. And today, uh, more of the, uh, this past year in 2023, uh, we had uh, about 70 bills introduced affecting condo associations. Only four or five pass, but Every year they're trying to tweak the consumer protection side of this. And, uh, and so we saw some major shifts in legislation this year with regard to condo associations particularly. What, can you tell us more about the major shifts that we saw or that we're gonna be seeing? Well, you know, there, there were several, I'm gonna call them major events in the last couple of years. We all heard about the Florida condominium, Champaign Towers West or South, I think it is, it collapsed, you know, and then uh, uh, people lost their lives on top of that, lost their homes. And, you know, if they had mortgages, that's another story. Well, then on top of that, we've read in the paper here locally of several larger condominium towers where they've had major multi million dollar assessments that were not planned for, resulting in uh, major assessments, uh, special assessments to the homeowners of up to $50,000 per unit. And so, uh, you know, we had a reserve law adopted in 1992. So how can that happen if you're doing your reserves correctly? So the laws we've seen that uh, have been impacted was to bring our budget reserve study side more in line with national standards. And number two, <clears throat> with greater emphasis on disclosure, which is our core class this year, disclosure, 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 um, and, and more requirements for associations to disclose more in summaries in the budget when they distribute it to the homeowners or potential buyers. So a lot more emphasis on the reserves and, uh, and the financial situation of the association. Well, that's good news. <clears throat> well, you know, uh, go ahead. Hey, Richard, you know, you had mentioned um, that there's over 2000, like 2073 condos in the entire state of Hawaii, over 400,000 condo residents. And there's millions and millions of dollars in special assessments. On average, maybe close to three hundred thousand dollars in special assessments, you know, per condo. And I think you had mentioned on one of the slides, there's you know, of course, residential, uh, multi-zone, uh, commercial. I mean, just a whole uh, myriads of uh, types of condos. 
So when it, you know, when you're talking about $600 million in uh, special assessments, what, what type of assessments are we really talking about for these buildings? Well, probably the correct term would be regular assessment. And that is the maintenance fees that are charged on a monthly basis to the owners. I've never particularly liked the word maintenance fee because you get water sewer, you get insurance, you may have some of these concierge level condominiums, concierge and front desk services. So it's more of an operating fee, but over the decades, we've called it a maintenance fee, which kind of tells people it's for maintenance, which is not true. It's, a, it's really an operating fee. The problem is when 514B, originally 514A was written, it really established a condominium as an organization. And as an organization, the legislature has little power to change that contractual relationship between a board and the owners who are in the governing documents and the founding documents. The legislature can't interfere with private contracts. So you're kind of stuck with that, to, to live with that aspect of it. But these maintenance fees, you see, for some reason, my experience has been, boards have this thought that their goal is to keep from raising maintenance fees. That's their purpose in life is not to raise maintenance fees. If they didn't do, if they do, they've done a bad job. <clears throat> Put it in logical perspective. Under the law, a condominium budget is prepared on what we call a zero-sum basis. That means you add up all the operating expenses, you add up what your reserves should be based on a reserve study, and you multiply it by the percentage of common interest. So that's what the maintenance fee is, or the operating fee, regular assessment under the law. But what happens if you underestimated the electricity? The electricity is $100,000 more this year. Well, where does the money come from? You didn't collect enough from any, everybody to do it. It comes typically because they don't fund the reserves because they're short money and they got to pay the electric bill and they haven't been putting enough aside that they can fund the reserves per the reserve study. So what we're seeing is a problem in the industry is all this, with these older buildings now, is hitting the fan. It's a huge assessment for those associations that did not properly plan and put enough money aside. Richard, well, let me ask you, yeah, I mean, that that's a great point in perspective. And in terms of, you know, these budgets and reserves and the financial aspect of it, is it the board members who's overseeing this? Is it the property managers? Who's actually ultimately responsible to make sure that, you know, each of the condo buildings have enough funds and they're looking, you know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 years out? Well, that's a good question. Um, the short answer I always tell everybody is that in the end, the board is ultimately responsible for everything under the statute. They they have the ultimate responsibility. They may hire lawyers or reserve specialists or, or property managers to guide them, but there's nothing the law says that the board has to listen to them. You know, And so the board ultimately is responsible, but one of the standard of care for a board is to rely on professional advice. You know, you, you can't stick your head in the sand because you know nothing about this topic and ignore what professionals are telling you. So I think the overall problem has been is that, it, that the boards just don't want to raise maintenance fees. They don't look at the true cost of what it costs to maintain a building, and they want to skimp on the uh, budget saying, well, well, we'll make it work at a lesser amount than it's actual. If you take the one recently in the paper, which was, I think, one Archer Lane, the $17 million was the assessment, if I remember correctly. I have a database of all the reserve contributions and all the maintenance fees for most of the projects in Hawaii. You can take that one project and look at their comparison of maintenance fees with other like projects or similar projects, and they were paying per average unit about $200 a month less than similar projects in the state. Well, if you take $200 times 400 units times 15 years, there's the $17 million you're short, you know, in round terms. So, I think at the end of the day, the board is ultimately responsible. But what's interesting in the current legislature, 2023, <clears throat> they passed the law because under the current law, the board can do the reserve study themselves. They don't have to hire a professional. So the law was amended and changed the effect of 2023. Every board, not less than every three years, has to have that reserve study, if not prepared by a certified professional, independently reviewed, for its adequacy. Now, the interesting thing about laws are you can say, a board can say, okay, I'm going to go hire somebody to do that. And they can get the review and the board can then shrug its shoulders and said, 
thank you for the review. Review. I'm still not going to do that. So uh, it's not a perfect world because under the uh, national standards, uh, and you may I may have mentioned to you that I'm in the National Task Force for Public Policy and Reserve Studies. So uh, it's, the, the title is it's a budgeting tool. It is not science. You don't go out and get engineers and architects to look at issues. It's kind of budgeting a cash flow to give you the best chance of having enough money when the money comes due. And if thoughtfully done, works out really well. And you see associations not having major assessments and problems with the reserves. Richard, I'm so curious. Like, how did you get, how did you become so passionate about condominiums in Hawaii or real estate in Hawaii? Like, how did it all begin? I had bills to pay. <laughs> I needed a job. Now, it's, it's you know, it's interesting. I shouldn't say this probably, but uh, I use this as kind of a joke because the you know, condominium management is a tough business with all the homeowners, the agendas, the private issues. You know, all the condos are different. There isn't one size fits all. So I got into the industry in 1992 um, and, and, and fell in love with it because I have a, a good ability to talk to people and bring common sense to the table. And that caused me to get more and more engaged in the various uh, technical aspects. But the joke I use often is that, you know, um, uh, two guys are talking and they're looking at me and they're saying, you know, he's in condominium management. And they're saying, no, not condominium management. And uh, he looks so bright. <laughs> and, my, and, and, and the other guy says, well, just remember that the speed of sound is slower than the speed of light. So, <laughs> You know, but no, I, I am passionate about it because I feel the boards, even the management companies today, don't have, in all cases, the technical expertise to understand the options. Even if you're underfunded reserves, there are choices today you can make to get yourself back on target without it being too punitive. You know, I have a condo project I do consulting for, and um, they this year raise their maintenance fees 50%. Now, wow. why would they raise it 50%? Well, prior to then, the old board took honor in the fact they hadn't raised their maintenance fees in 10 years. And what do you think they did to the reserve contributions over 10 years? Because costs went up. They reduced the reserve contributions every year, every year. So this large project, at the end, when I, before I got to be a consultant, for 400 units, was contributing on an annual basis Five dollars a month per unit towards reserves. Wow, I mean that's horrible. So I think that we need to have more education with board members, more uh, workshops, more uh, solution-based answers because uh, it's, it's solvable. I'm not going to say you don't have to raise fees because in that case they had to raise fees fifty percent, you know. But they had ten years of a free ride, you know. So uh, uh, I just think boards need more education. They need to understand that. Their fiduciary duty is to the association and to preserve and protect the assets and make the place a nice place for people to live. That's the equity portion of it. You know, as it pertains to the condo owner themselves, when they are imp when an assessment's imposed, I mean, what are their choices really? Because what if they're not financially prepared to to pay whatever assessment it is? If it's you know tens of thousands of dollars, and what what have you seen in that in those cases? Well, what I say to boards when we come across that, let's just say they have a $10,000 assessment per unit. And I mean no, no disrespect by saying this. You have haves and have nots. Some, they'll write you a check for ten grand, or, or they have the bank ability to just go borrow it from a bank. But then you're going to have the have nots. So if you're assessing the amount of money you need and only 20% and don't have the money, your 20% is shorting and paying the vendor. So what are you going to do? Assess the other 80% the ballot to pay the vendor? You have to pay the vendor. So we always promote a dual choice. One, approve a loan over, you can get up to 20-year amortization, and maybe that's $100 a month. And uh, those owners who want to pay the present value and not have the $100 a month for the loan can do so. So you give the haves and the have-nots a chance to keep their home and and not be affected by that. So uh, we promote uh, lo loans and borrowing. If you build the concept correctly, we have present value payoffs. So that owner sells his unit, the new buyer demands the present value be paid off. It all 
sorts itself out over time. So uh, we promote don't stick your head in the sand, come up with a financial plan. Because if the, if the answer is $100 a month, you know, even though that's a lot of money to some people, you still have to uh, deal with it. And, and what I've been saying all along to the legislature, this everything they do when they make these legislative mandates only make it harder for affordable housing because the money has to go to somebody. If it goes to the association, it ultimately goes to the owner. So someone's got to pay for it. So we need better planning and better analysis of how this works. Not so bad, really, once you really start looking at what your choices are. Hey, Richard. So, you know, in terms of prospective buyers looking at condos, so if you are a buyer now, you know, with all your knowledge and expertise, and, you know, you're looking through the condo documents and you're trying to get information, what would you be paying the most attention to? Good question. In July of 2023, Governor signed a new law that required seven specific disclosures in the condominium budget. I'm very familiar with it because I wrote it. And the problem is that people who are new time, first time owners, even long time owners, don't understand these documents and they're usually about three or four inches thick and they don't know what to look for. So the new law that was adopted mandated, beginning with, for all practical purposes, 2024, it was effective in 2023, but most condo budgets are calendar year, mandated seven specific disclosures. And they were kind of as follows in short term. Number one, how much money do you have in reserves? How much money did the reserve study say you're supposed to put in? Did you last year put that amount of money in the reserve study? If you did not, what is the impact on the future contribution? What does the reserve study future contribution show? Because you can do a reserve study that shows 10% increases in contributions every year, not maintenance fees, but the reserve portion of the maintenance fees. To disclose all these future financial obligations that either weren't done the prior year or need to be done next year. If the budget summary is included as required by law, that's the first thing I would look at. At the seven things, which gives you a real litmus test on the financial condition of the association in simple uh, layman's language. That's awesome. So definitely by 2024, we should see that sort of summary with the seven, seven things to look for within the condo docs that are, like you said, three inches three inches high in, in most cases. <laughs> well, I'm hopeful the managing agents get engaged and the boards get engaged in this because I'm telling you right now that mortgage companies are going to be looking at reserves closer and and, and, and it'll be harder to get. In the, I, I know of projects today that can't get a mortgage because their reserves are in such bad shape. And uh, so you're going to see that aspect of it. I see often, because I do this expert work, where new owners buy and there's a special assessment and they sue the board and the managing agent saying your budget and your reserve state didn't comply with the law. And there was no identification that there's going to be a, that we're underfunded. They needed to have a special assessment the year after they bought uh, in that particular unit. So you're going to see more and more lawsuits regarding that issue. And that's why I'm hopeful that managing agents take this mandatory budget disclosure and put the time and energy in to make it worthwhile. Because I think the industry will write itself if we have the, uh, penalizing the board and say, we're going to find the board a thousand dollars. is not going to work. Nobody's going to serve on the board, you know? So you need to have more disclosure and let the mortgage companies and the banks and, and the buyers affect uh, the real estate values. And then things will start to write itself. My opinion anyway. Richard. So, you know, just um, those seven items that you discussed, I mean, I, I think that's really vital for any prospective buyers. So if uh, if you see something like, okay, there's a big special assessment coming up or increase in maintenance fees of 20% or there's pending litigation, you know, how, how do you view those items? Well, I would look at what it says and uh, to determine how much it may not bother me that they have a loan and they're going to fix everything. And I love the building and it's still affordable to me to pay the loan and the and the maintenance fees. So it may not bother me, may make it more positive because they're fixing the building and taking care of it, right? So I have to take each case separately and look at uh, what, what the report says. But the fact that it's a mandatory disclosure, there really is no excuse for a buyer not to 
read that one page or two pages, depending on the complexity, and understand fully what they're buying into, what the financial future is going to look like for that project. You know, and uh, um, uh, I do a lot of consulting on reserve studies, and and there's some good reserve studies out there, and there's some very bad reserve studies. And uh, I, I teach a CE class called Understanding Condo Financial Statements. It's written for licensees. It's not written for property managers. And I go through all the financial documents, pointing out the areas you should, you as a licensee should be aware of. But again, a licensee is not trained at this either. They're not going to want to offer professional opinions on something. They can always say, I would talk to a reserve expert or this is what the document says, not opine on whether they agree with it or disagree with it. You know, but uh, I think the more disclosure we can have, the better off for the industry. I agree with you. And, you know, another part of your sort of the way that you're serving is I understand that you're a Hawaii real estate commissioner. Yes. Yes. And so I'm wondering, can you just kind of generally just what what are the responsibilities of the Hawaii Real Estate Commission? What is their function? What do they do? What do you do? <laughs> well, I understand that there's the staff, which is the Real Estate Commission staff, which is the full time employees of the state who really handle the operations on a day-to-day -day basis. The Real Estate Commission is a part of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. And everything I'm saying to you as an individual, I'm not speaking as a commissioner. It just certainly knows. <clears throat> so when you look at that, you have basically within DCCA, when it gets to uh, licensing, uh, two agencies which are separate. One is called the Regulated Industry Complaint Office, which handles complaints for all licensees whether it be a hairdresser, used car dealer, a real estate licensee. And then you have the Real Estate Commission, which sets the policies of the, uh, of the for real estate under the laws and the statute. So what do we do as a commission? Well, first of all, we're approving those people who pass their tests and have qualified to be a licensee. We're approving their licenses. In some cases, because uh, they have some prior legal baggage we're giving them predeterminations that if they take the classes and pass them, and they're not wasting their money, we would still approve them as a licensee because people get drunk driving by licenses, all sorts of things in the past. And they don't want to spend the money for classes and if they aren't going to get approved because of the way the, they, they have to have the Real Estate Commission's approval. Then we have um, matters where RICO has negotiated a settlement on a violation of the real estate law. They are handled by the Real Estate Commission for approval. So we will have three or four cases a month where there's been some issue, uh, could be a misrepresentation, could be failing to keep the trust funds correct. There's a zillion uh, of those where the the uh, RICO has negotiated a settlement and, and and we approve the settlement. Now, if they're unable to agree upon a settlement, RICO and, uh, and the licensee, then it would actually go to a formal hearing before the Real Estate Commission where you present your case and do depositions and and make arguments. We don't see that too often. Usually these things resolve themselves uh, pretty quickly. Um, uh, people may not agree with all the resolutions, but there is a fairly significant penalty to a licensee for not following the law. You know, So that's kind of what we do. We approve CE classes. We approve uh, core classes. We um, uh, have subcommittees for condominiums and and laws. We do lobbying at the legislature and propose laws and things like that. But it's done by nine-member commission. Some are from the public at large. Some are vendors. Some are licensees and uh, from a wide variety of brokerage firms. And uh, they're appointed by the gov uh, by, by the Senate. And uh, the chair is appointed by the governor. Great. Thank you for sharing about that, because I think that's good to know, right? Not everybody knows about the Real Estate Commission, and so you've defined it so eloquently. Thank you, and simply to understand. Well, it's interesting because it's, it's a volunteer job. You don't get paid for it. And this, it's, it's, it's a three to six hour a month commitment, and it mm -hmm. has very regulated policies and procedures, the public hearings, the openness, and sunshine law kind of stuff. But you can aid the community and the licensees as, as a whole and the, and the consumer protection by having people who are uh, knowledgeable and and um, not no conflict of interest, trying to uh, 
keep the industry safe and solid because in the real estate world, we have very few lawsuits on real estate matters compared to the other licensee type organizations. So it says a lot about our training and, and our and our ethics and integrity. That's great to know. And, and you know, just kind of going back to the uh, the condo topic, would you actually consider yourself an advocate for condo owners or for the associations? That's a great question because I'm an expert witness, right? Probably right. three out of four of my cases, I represent condo owners. And one out of four, I represent associations. I'm very proud of the fact you can take all my expert opinion and you'll never find I ever contradicted myself. I've been consistent on the four pillars of good governance and what, uh, you know, either the owner is wrong or right or the board's wrong or right. But I advocate trying to get together and resolve the issue versus uh, spend lots of money on legal fees. That's great to know. And, you know, from your perspective and, you know, especially for our viewers, because today was jam packed and I mean, you have so much knowledge to share. I mean, this could be like a five part series. Uh, you know, with that said, is there any last message that you want to share with our audience? Well, the thing I say always to the audience is remember this. A condominium is a organization established by statute or by laws. As soon as you live or buy in a condominium, you're subject to the statute and laws. And that means you have to give up certain rights. The appellate court recently ruled on a case that sometimes condo owners don't know they have to give up certain rights, like on how they walk their dog or when they can. Uh, I do a wonderful class on rulemaking, like can you can a board keep you from flying uh, or flying the American flag? It's quite an interesting, it's one of my core class or my CE classes. But the reality is we live in a condo, you have to give up certain rights and you're better off. If you have a problem, go sit down with your board and talk about it before you go hoo-hoo and get angry and, and start using insults. <laughs> you know, you're you're just so genuine and you can tell that you sincerely care about all the areas of expertise that you have. And we, we're just so appreciative that you came on Inside Hawaii Real Estate to share your knowledge. And we learned a lot. Well, thank you for inviting me. We we more than want to come back on another topic someday, but uh, I have that. a passion for the industry, and uh, and we have a good industry. Not that we don't have areas we can improve, but uh, I think that was the national liaison for all the states for CAI Community Association Institute. Our laws are more robust and more consumer protection than most any other state. The one thing all condos have in common in Hawaii with every other state is a, a function on self-governance. Uh, well, thank you so much, Richard. We really appreciate all your time. Yep, I hope we get together sometime and talk story. Sounds good. Most definitely. Thank you, Richard, and aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha to you guys. <laughs>